Welcome to almost the last session in the Google South Conference. Thank you for coming, and I know that um, Lee's talk is on, and that sounds really awesome, but thank you for coming to this one. Um, this is not a Drupal technical talk specifically, this is a planning and UX talk, um, so the kind of work that you might do before you start actually building the project. Um, and it talks about personas. So I'm Millie. Um, I work at a company called We for a small agency who do content-first um, projects, sometimes Drupal sites, sometimes not. We're really focused on UX and content strategy, and that's my focus. So um, this talk today is about personas. So how many of you people in the audience today have personally made a persona? Some. How many people have encountered a persona in a project? and didn't make it themselves. Um, and who has been confused by the purpose of a persona, whether you were making it or just dealing with it? Some? Yeah. So this talk is about that problem. Like, why do we have these persona things? What actually are they? And in fact, what do we even mean when we talk about personas? So I, I came across this problem when I was working on a few projects with people talking about personas, and I realized that we weren't actually talking about the same thing. Like they were saying persona and I was saying persona, but we were talking about something completely different. So, you know, I'd done some training and I knew what I thought they were, so I went on a bit of a mission to find out a bit more about them and about how the industry perceives them. So if we look it up look up the definition, we're told that a persona is the aspect of someone's character that is presented to or perceived by others. So this is a really like without putting any framework of design or marketing or anything on top of it, that's what the word persona means. It's, it comes from this idea of a mask. It's a mask sort of from the dramatic arts, the persona is like the character that you might play. So it's kind of relevant, it's kind of it, but it's kind of not. You get this feeling that when we're talking about it now, I just think that's not really what we're saying. So what do other people mean? What are some of these other sort of confusing definitions that are out there? From what I can tell, people are saying that maybe when I'm talking about the they're talking about personas, they're saying it's a way to describe the behavior of a type of user I have assumed existed. Maybe it's a way to describe user group that we've identified in our marketing. Maybe it's a way to describe a client or stakeholder who is giving us the money. And maybe it's just a person that wants to have some opinions. So what do we mean? Like in terms of UX and, and strategy, what do we, what is, what is this talk about? What am I talking about? I'm really talking about persona as a summary of user research, and this is sort of the most important piece of the puzzle. It's a document, it's presented in a simple format that's easily referenced and easily memorized, and it describes a person who represents a set of traits from a significant user type, and it has specific measurable goals. So this is, for me, this is the definition of the UX persona, and what the talk is about. So why do we actually make them? Yes, Tim. Yeah, yeah, I'd say user archetype, maybe user type, I, I guess. I, I mean, really, persona is very common now, and I guess that's the whole thing, is the word is used quite a lot. Yeah, it, but it's, I don't think it's totally standardized. I think it's used a lot, but I don't think it's clear exactly what it means yet. So why do we make them? So, as I said before, we want to make them primarily, primarily to communicate findings from our user research, to remind us of our user's goals throughout the design and development process, to build empathy, to use the power of narrative, to inform further research and testing, and to help focus on solving real problems, and also to help other people understand design decisions. So, but first, I want to talk about some common mistakes with personas, and I think it's a good way to ground where we're coming with this. So, the first persona mistake is that the persona might have been made for the right purpose. So if you're the person in the crowd who's inherited a persona, you might have inherited a marketing buyer persona, and they've been given to you in your design process and development process. So marketing or buyer personas are different because they're focused on demographic information, buying motivations and concerns, shopping and buying preferences, marketing message, media habits, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But you can usually pick them quickly because they've got ranges, like this person is 30 to 40 years old or 40 to 60 years old, and they might live in this region or this region. They're very much about trying to find a segment 
Um, they describe customer behavior, but they don't get to the why behind it. So this is a very big distinction. And they tend to be not that useful for solution development, but they're very good for marketing. So like the marketing people can have them, they can use them, but they're not quite the same for what we're doing. So this is a good example of a marketing container. Um, you can see that Fred has got specific parts in this container that says he's shopping in industry and use preferences. Um, and he's got you know, the age range 45 to 55. So you can, he's, he's useful for selling something. Whether he's useful for us trying to build something is a different question. So maybe you, you've also inherited a proto persona. A proto persona comes from Lean UX. I think Lean UX is excellent. Um, but the thing about proto personas is they're made as assumptions before you've actually done any research. So this is like us taking a guess, making a hypothesis. So proto personas exist as this sort of shorthand, quick sketch, and they're, they're fundamentally unvalidated. They haven't been tested with your people. They're just our assumptions. So they can be useful, but you do have to actually validate them with research. And that's what a proto persona looks like. So this is the Lean UX book. If you are looking to get into UX thinking and, and you know, want to from the start, highly recommend this book. It's a really great way to get into it without sort of feeling like you have to invest heaps of money into it. Um, so this is, uh, in the proto persona, it's four segments of a page. It's literally just a piece of a four people are folded, and it's got the, um, like a picture of them, um, the key facts, and then we've got needs, served by, and then um, up there he's talking about like the, yeah, some more key facts about them. So I'll talk a bit more about persona later, personas, proto personas later. Um, but yeah, the point is that this isn't exactly quite right either. It's, it's closer, but it's not quite there. So the other type of persona is this type of persona that we want to do, the UX design persona. So, the difference between this and the other ones is that they really focus around goals and pain points and describing behavior. So it's very much about like wants and needs and not so much about job topics. So they're based on field research and real people. They aren't actual individual real people, but they're based on them. They describe the why behind what people do, not just what they do. And they help you remember that end user throughout the entire product development process. So not just in the marketing stage. They're really good for communicating research insights and they really help avoid the elastic user and so forth and so design. So that's the concept that sometimes if we take the best guess and we make it up and we think about who our user might be and we just invent it. So now we're probably just going to make someone who's a little bit like us. Um, and that ends up that we're designing something for people like us rather than having that inclusive design for people who are unlike us, which is where we really want to go. So this is an example of a UX persona, a design persona. We've got, um, you've got sort of a, a narrative section and we've got their goals. Um, on the top right hand corner, we've got a bit of a um, metrics of the different preferences. And we have um, sort of like a, a statement at the top about what his main intention is and what he wants to achieve. Um, so the second main problem that uh, happens with personas is that the persona is imaginary. And I alluded to this just earlier. So because personas are summaries, they're, they're an artifact that comes out of the user research process. Um, and this is probably where you're starting to think like, oh, I really have time for user research. I don't have a budget for it. User research doesn't have to be extensive, multi-week long process. You can do user research by interviewing five people for 20 minutes. And that would be enough for you to build some sort of insight about the product and the uses for your product or a project. They don't, fundamentally, personas don't just get made up by stakeholders. So even if you're doing, you know, a project with a customer and you have the, you know, the people who are paying you, you're in that room with them and you want to talk about your personas. If you guys just sit around and do it without talking to actual users, you're not doing a UX design persona, you're doing something else. Um, they're an aggregate of the common traits that emerge from user interviews and user research. So we don't just meet one person and then take down the notes and put them up as a persona. We, we do this process where we meet, talk to a few people and then the pattern that emerges, we summarize that as a persona. So to do this, the first thing that we do is we make a hypothesis. So we don't know the answer yet. We sort of have a We take this. And, and that hypothesis shouldn't be where it ends. It should be the start. So once you've got your hypothesis, 
you can go about um, taking it to the next level with, where you're actually sucking it to people. So you're testing your hypothesis when you're talking to people. You're saying, you're not necessarily testing it with them directly and, and asking them a question, but you're asking them questions about their experience. It helps you to understand if your hypothesis is right or wrong. And a lot of the times you're right. Sometimes we know our, our users really well. A lot of the times you're wrong and you have to adjust. So step three, you do other research. You can do those five interviews. You can do all sorts of things. You can do focus groups, surveys, data analysis. Maybe you look at existing work that's been done. Maybe you talk to some stakeholders as well. But all of this comes together in a research phase. Um, then step four is we synthesize and analyze and look for patterns. So the whole point of this, and I know that this looks like UX with this post sticks on the wall, but the idea is that when, when you do this research, you get a lot of information. And it's really easy for you to privilege the information that is more like your own experience. So by putting it up on the wall and grouping it, you get to start seeing maybe things that you forgot about or maybe things that didn't stand out at the time, and, that, and then you can see those patterns. So once you've got the, the, this information synthesized, you can start collating it. So you can start to pull out the key metrics. This is a project that I do sort of as a, a fake project about improving my key, the public transport system in Melbourne. And the, out, out of the people that I talked to, the key metrics that came out were like that, sort of like how often do they use it? What type of way do they use it? Um, do they care about their privacy? Do they use the internet to recharge it? And are they confused by it or do they understand it? And, and all of those letters on the left are all the different people that I've talked to rated on those scales. And then out of, on the left side, you can see that there are groups where people sort of scored in a similar point on that metric. And then on the right, those groups have been collapsed down into one point and that becomes my persona. So that persona becomes like an aggregate of the people that I've talked to, the main patterns that emerge from them. So the point is that you have to start with the users. Talking to real users reveals these tiny little elements of their stories that you can't just imagine up. So one of the, I didn't, um, this isn't a talk about user research, but a great way to think about how to do a user research interview is to say to someone, tell me about the last time you did this. And that, rather than saying, do you like this? Or should we change this? Or what do you think of this? Or, you know, what do you, what's your problem with this? You actually just ask them to describe their experience. And as they go through that story, they're answering your questions anyway. They're just not answering them directly. But they're also giving you these extra little bits of information that may end up actually giving you more than those questions directly. So you don't always understand everyone's needs. You, you, you don't know every person. You haven't had every person's experience. So this allows us to um, get that fuller picture. It also is really important to stay humble and accept that you just don't know how to solve every single problem and you don't know everyone's perspective. So sometimes I find that you know, the people who are a bit un unsure about whether they should do the user research have a real sense that they already know the problem. I, I already do it. So stepping back and, and sort of taking that humble approach and being like, I don't know how to solve this, even if you think that you have a gut feeling, that humility allows you to really get that real user perspective. So we want to step into that beginner's mind, and it, that will allow us to be open to design for people who aren't just people like us. The third problem that I see a lot is that a persona is too specific. So we want to be specific in a persona design, but we want to be specific about the right things. So I can write like a an epic story about Simon's journey, but I need to make sure that I'm writing about the right parts of his journey. That will actually help me do this project. So the question says, does this information help answer design questions for a group of users? So if, if we've just gone overboard with Simon's journey about you know, what he ate for breakfast and what car he drives and how he didn't get to work and I'm actually just making, you know, like a, a clothes shopping website or something, I've, I've been specific but it's not that helpful. I mean, it tends to actually distract from the whole purpose of a persona. If you're one of the people who put your hand and to say that they were confused about what the purpose of the persona is, you might have received something just like, I don't know how this helps me. And that could just be the, the specific information is wrong. So let's say we're designing a website for Drupal 5. So we want to be specific about the right things. So like, what do users of this website want to achieve? Who, who can help me? What is someone who wants to use the Drupal site website, what do they want to do? 
buy tickets, do we set see the schedule? Anything else? Find a location. Cool. So this is stuff that we want to write map each other these are the the users' goals. What problems do they want to solve? What problem could you be having? Don't have a ticket? What about Right. Is this is this right for me? Do I even want to go? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, is it right for my staff? Um, should I pay for this? Um, and then we want to, you know, we do these interviews, we see things like, what are the recurring things? So, like, I don't know all of you, but maybe there are things about you that are similar. So, maybe you work in similar industries. Maybe um, you, you're in similar areas. Maybe you do similar types of jobs, but I don't know yet until I start speaking to some people. So, that would mark that pack my advantage. Also, what specific things about them are you trying to address? So, like, you know, what are their, out of these pain points, what specific ones do we want to tackle? So, everyone might have the same problem, but, like, they're a bit confused about what Drupal is, but we don't want to tackle that with this project. So, we, we, we choose the problems that we actually want to tackle, and that becomes quite a benefit to as well. So, it helps us stay on track. But we don't want to be talking about the wrong things. We want to be specific about the wrong things. Like, it doesn't really matter how old our users are. Maybe it's more effective to note their level of computer savvy. Does it really matter what media they consume? Maybe it'd be more effective to note the device that they're using. Um, it, maybe it's more relevant um, to know, you know, rather than their age. Maybe it's maybe we want to talk about are they senior? Do they do they have access to the company budget? Maybe that kind of thing is more relevant for solving the problems that we chose to solve. So you often get these personas that just have like sort of irrelevant information in them, and it really distracts from the focus. So fundamentally, it's all about context. So what you're building is really you, the goal of the project, it always comes back to that. So what you're specific about comes back to that goal. So yes, adding details about a person's life and their, you know, their dog and their car might make them seem more relatable and seem more real, and, and that's, it, that's true. But you really want to ask yourself, how could this piece of information be relevant to my project? And why do I need to include it in this design? Because we don't have all the time in the world to make these things. We just want to make them effective for the project that we're trying to do. On the flip side, this is the other problem with the persona is too general. So this is the persona I made. He's Mark. He is a human being. He's between age 20 and 60, works in office and has two thumbs. Just wants to drink beer and have fun. Also likes sports, wishes he could cook better. Can never tell whether daylight saving is forward or back. Works in the desk and dies lunch sometimes. Like he's not useful for anyone. He's literally almost everyone. The fact that I even called him my like, is he's everyone. He's every person. So you know, I've I've had things like this given to me, and I'm not really sure what to do with it because it doesn't help me do anything. You can kind of see how these personas need to be tailored to the project that you're working on. If you have a persona from the last website, you go, like, yeah, I'll reuse it. There's probably something wrong there. So, got a goal you want situation, <laughs> don't want to be too specific, don't want to be too general. One of the, the main things, you want to remember that those key facts are better than demographics. If you keep going back to, like, how old are they, where do they live, you know, what gender are they, what, all this stuff, like, that could be really like distracting you from the goal of why you're doing this. So and ask yourself like who does this person not this person not represent? Like, you know, if we want to make a very broad website, that is definitely a thing. A lot of us work with government websites and things like that. We do have to, you know, have multiple audiences. We we can still narrow it down enough to make it a significant user group, not just a one. And remember that if you get a template or something online or from a different project, it just might not be right for this project. You have to really take that contextual approach and figure out what is right for this specific goal. And don't design for the lowest common denominator because it usually doesn't work out that way. You can't please all the people all the time. And it's better to do one thing rather than to do ten things poorly. Another problem, number five of seven, is that persona is too static. And this might be a bit sort of counter to how you use personas. You might have one, you put it up on the wall, that's it. But if you're doing sort of the kind of approach that's becoming more popular where we're iterating, building, measuring, learning, constantly going around this cycle, and updating, feeding more research into the process, it can be really um, 
a bit sad when someone goes to all the making this persona and then, you know, they do more research later and they never update it and then weeks down the track, developers using it and it's not relevant anymore because more information came into the loop. So what we do is we hypothesize and we observe, we do this research and then we update the persona. We can continue to do that process throughout the project. There's no reason why that has to stop, especially when it doesn't take very long to do. So if throughout the course of the project something changes, you don't want to just leave this artifact just being outdated, you'll just confuse people. So we want to make sure that it stays fresh. So that proto persona structure is a really good way to think about how you might want to start with something and then update it and then continue to work with it. So we start with the sketch in the mini bio, we've got their pains and gains, behaviors and relevant key facts. So this is really easy to do. Like you can do this at the start of your next project. And then as you go through and you found that more information about your users, you can update it and make this seem more and more relevant. Um, and that means that you have to be validating it. So if that one is wrong and you do your user interview and it turns out you were wrong, that's it. It's wrong. Start again. Do a different one. Like, you don't have to be precious about it. And one of the greatest things about doing this kind of work is that you don't actually have to be like an amazing Photoshop genius to make a persona. You can do it on a piece of paper and it can still be really useful. Um, so you can only validate things by actually testing it with your users. And that leads me to number six, which is that the persona is too beautiful for this world. Um, you really want to make sure that your persona is real, to some extent. Like, it's not an actual person, but it needs to be real-ish. So, using a photo of a real person, even if the person is not exactly them, that allows us to really build a bit more empathy. So, stock photos encourage us to pretend that the user is too made up or too agile. They wouldn't ever really think that. That's not what people are actually like. And, you know, you might have got this glossy stock photo, but whether it actually inspires that sort of conversation about someone's needs is a different question. So, images of real people encourage empathy and are force us, and they force us to take people's needs when they're seriously. Nobody really believes that Becca is a real person, right? She's obviously a stock photo. She looks way too shiny. And I just don't really, I don't look at that and I'm like, yeah, man, I, I've met Becca before, I know who she is. Like, no, nah, like she's some Getty images, it doesn't matter. But someone like Marie, I'm like, yeah, I've met a Marie before. Like, Marie's like, my friend's mom. Like, I get it. I, I know what her life is like. I know what kind of thing she, she wants. I know, you know, what she might be like to talk to. Like, I have no idea what it would be like to talk to Becca. She's kind of like a weird robot. But Marie is like, she's real. And, and this is the thing, is like these, these documents are meant for a purpose of like sparking conversation and getting us talking about people's needs and their goals. So that empathy is a super important piece of the puzzle. So don't spend hours also making this persona in Photoshop. Like, Scrappy is actually really okay. Like, we get it, you're a designer. But is that useful? Can I reference it? Does it make any sense to me? Can I bring it out in a meeting and get information from it? Like, probably not. It's too black. It's just like, it's, it's beautiful, but it's not useful. Sometimes this might actually be more effective. I can put that on the wall and I can see it from far away. I can reference it in an argument. I'm having with a developer on the other side of the room and I can tell the CEO, but like, what about Anne? What about what Anne wants? And just point over there and go, oh, yeah, I get it. You know, this, this is too, this is not as effective for that. And really, like, even a sketchy persona like this, that can be useful for you if that's the kind of company that you have. Like, you know, maybe you're just like, oh, no, no, this is on the wall. Yep, that's what it is. Like, it, I can get that done in 15 minutes. I don't have to take two hours in Photoshop to do it, and I can start working with it straight away. So the last problem is that, I actually think there might be another problem that I added on the end, but the persona is the only UX artifact. So um, personas aren't really the prize. Like, this is not the reason why we do designs and team UX or that stuff. They're not very scientific. Like, they're, they're a memory jogger, they're a bargaining chip, they're a summary. They're something that we can remember all that really good research work that we do. It's not actually the reason why we do this. So, if you're only using this persona, it will help a bit, but it's not enough to drive an entire project on its own. Like, we need to have this other data and research backing it up. And there's like a whole lot of discussion in the UX world about this, about how this sort of a bit outdated. And I'll get to that a little bit later. So you should be doing other things. You should be doing focus groups and surveys and governance as you can. If you can't, that's good. 
too. You can figure out other things to do that might take less time. But you know, there's this whole sort of world of research that we can tap into. But sometimes it isn't really as expensive as you think it is, and, and it's really worth doing. Um, so the last problem, final one, which is an add-on to seven, is that the persona is in the draw. Why go to all the effort of making a persona and never ever look at it again? Um, you might have seen, you've probably got like that Google Drive folder where you put like personas and it's like never open it. And it's just like, oh yeah, you gave that to me to sell the paper. So there's no point. Like why do it? Like why do this work if you never even, if you never even work with it? So you can, here are some ideas of what you might want to do with it. Print it out, put it on the table and then tell it to me about the project script maybe. Maybe you want to have it when you have your meetings with clients and stakeholders about scope. Maybe you want to put it on the wall where other parts of the company or the project team can see it. Or where your engineers can see it. Or you, the designer, might want to see it. You just put it on your nightstand so you can like, look at your users every night and think about them in their minutes and have seconds. So, top tips for personas. What we really want to do is use the personas to build them for you. So, and he's very buzzword at the moment. Essentially, empathy allows us to get people to think about people who are not them. And design personas, designing personas in a workshop really like absolutely supercharges that empathy. So rather than you doing the whole thing on your own, get your whole team involved. Make it a, a team sport where everyone thinks about what users needs are, not just you. Because that sucks when you're the only person who's ever thought about or met any users and everyone just doesn't really believe you. So doing it in a team is an excellent thing to do. Empathy maps are another form of personas that can be used for a different stage of the project. And an empathy map is this idea where you put yourself, it's sort of like a group exercise where you just put yourself in, in, in your user's shoes. So you make a document where you draw a picture of them, and get a picture of them, and you put you know, what they're thinking, seeing, feeling, doing, the pains and the games, and then you to the user. And they look kind of like this. This is, you know, again, like a sketchy version, but this is something you can just do with everyone on a table. And it doesn't, obviously it's not as scientific as like processing and synthesizing research, but it, it's, it's a start. It's, it's building that empathy. Um, so, this is another thing. Personas should really be focused around verbs. Do I have any engineers in the room? Couple? So, when we talk about personas, we're really talking about that verb-based thing. So, a lot of programmers, especially in sort of the OR world, think a lot in terms of nouns. So this is like, this is a user, and this is a cart, and this is a checkout, and this is a store. And we really want to talk about the actions that people are doing around those nouns. So personas with nouns is like a woman, an office worker, or developer. With adjectives, maybe it's a young woman, an ambitious office worker, or a company developer. With verbs, we're starting to get a sense of her story and what she's trying to do. So. She's traveling from Sydney, she wants to learn more, she teaches in the tour. So getting this, like, the story starts coming out when we add the verbs in. It's a really good way to think when you're looking at those percentage of where the verbs and just start, you know, thinking about verb-based, action-based mindset. This is an amazing article that I um, highly recommend to anyone who is working with engineers or interested in engineering. It's called The Kingdom of Nouns. And it's, it's actually talking about how in OO programming, the nouns are really dominant, but we really don't privilege the verbs as much as we should. And I'm not going to read this to you, but the idea is that nouns are things and, and they're useful things, but then the world isn't just made of things. Like, action is actually what builds our world. Action is what builds emotions and what drives people and motivates people. And change requires action. Action is what gives life its spice. Action even gives spices their spice. After all, they're not spicy until you eat them. Nouns may be everywhere, but life's constant change and constant interest is all in the place. So really, like, think about these, the, the way that people do things and what they're doing and how they want to do them and, and, and think of the verbs for your personas. It's a really good way to get away from those demographics as well. Everyone loves a story. So one of the great things about personas is they tap into our narrative instinct. So your persona is actually your protagonist in the journey of your product. So people remember, the great thing is people actually remember stories really easily. It, they activate this like, certain part of the brain, it's about empathy. They provide context for motivations and needs. They also just kind of work as like a bit of a conversational lubricant. They get people thinking and talking in a, in a structure that they understand, which is people and, and humans and stories. And they give some of these otherwise quite dry requirements a bit of meaning and purpose by weaving things together in a bit of a journey. 
So the other thing that you can do is that you can use personas to help you recruit for usability testing. Um, that's not to say that you look at your persona and only recruit people who are like that, but um, you can you can use them as like a way to start thinking about what kind of people you might want to test this website with. And of course, you can use your personas to help other people see the value of UX design decisions. Um, this is a great image. It's the CEO saying, how oh, will this increase sales volume? And the project manager says, how long is this going to take? And the database engineer says, this doesn't involve me. Also, I want a sandwich. And you know, you can point to that persona and be like, hey, I'm primary persona and partner chief for goals. Is that a good enough reason to do this thing? And that might be a really great way to win that argument. So I know that sounds like a lot. Lean personas is a really great way to start thinking about an easy way to get into this. And uh, I'm really into the sort of lean approach of just doing it, getting it up, and then iterating it. So I want to talk about this methodology called jobs to be done. Um, jobs to be done is the basic, the basic premise is that people hire products to get a job done. If you can uncover the job, it puts you in the right context for creating a solution. So I'm going to show you this short video because it's pretty life changing and I hope that it sort of has the same, has the same effect on you going on. Oh. If I can test it. Hi, my name is Clay Christensen. I'm a professor at the Harvard Business School. I brought with me a set of puzzles, all related to innovation. We decided that the way we teach marketing is at the core of what makes motivation difficult to achieve. The most helpful way we've thought of it so far is that we actually hire products to do things for us. And understanding what job we have to do in our lives for which we would hire a product is really the key to cracking this problem of motivating customers to buy what we're offering. So I wanted just to tell you a story about a project we did for one of the big fast food restaurants. They were trying to goose up the sales of their milkshakes. They had just studied this problem up the gazoo. They brought in customers who fit the profile of the quintessential milkshake consumer. And they'd give them samples and ask, could you tell us how we can improve our milkshakes so you'd buy more of them? Do you want it chocolatey or cheaper, chunky or chewy? Or make it very clear feedback. They would then improve the milkshake on those dimensions, and it had no impact on sales or profits whatsoever. So one of our colleagues went in with a different question on his mind, and that was, I wonder what job arises in people's lives that cause them to come to this restaurant to hire a milkshake. So we stood in a restaurant for 18 hours one day and just took very careful data. What time did they buy these milkshakes? What were they wearing? Were they alone? Did they buy other food with it? Did they eat it in the restaurant or drive off with it? It turned out that nearly half of the milkshakes were sold before 8 o'clock in the morning. The people who bought them were always alone. It was the only thing they bought, and they all got in the car and drove off with it. So to figure out what job they were trying to hire it to do, we came back the next day and stood outside the restaurant so we could confront these folks as they left milkshake in hand. And in language that they could understand, we essentially asked, excuse me, please, but i got to sort this puzzle out. What job were you trying to do for yourself that caused you to come here and hire that milkshake? And they'd struggle to answer, so we'd then help them by asking other questions like, well, think about the last time you were in the same situation, needing to get the same job done, but you didn't come here to hire a milkshake. What did you hire? And then as we put all of their answers together, it became clear that they all had the same job to do in the morning. And that is, they had a long and boring drive to work. And they just needed something to do while they drove to keep their commute interesting. One hand had to be on the wheel, but somebody had given them another hand, and there wasn't anything in it. And they just needed something to do while they drove. They weren't hungry yet, but they knew they'd be hungry by 10 o'clock, so they also wanted something that would just pull down there and stay for that morning. Good question. What do I hire when I do this job? You know, I've never framed the question that way before, but 
Last Friday, I hired a banana to do the job. Take my word for it, never hire bananas. They're done in three minutes. You're hungry by 7.30. If you promise not to tell my wife, I probably hire donuts twice a week, but they don't do it well either. They're gone fast. They crumb all over my clothes. They get my fingers gooey. Sometimes I hire bagels, but as you know, they're so dry and tasteless that I have to steer the car with my knees while I'm putting jam on them, and then if the phone rings, we got a crisis. I never hired a Snickers bar once, but ah, I felt so guilty I'd never hired Snickers again. But let me tell you, when I come here and hire this milkshake, it is so viscous that it easily takes me 20 minutes to suck it up that thin little straw. Who cares what the ingredients are? I don't. All I know is I'm full all morning and it fits right here in my cup holder. Well, it turns out that the milkshake does the job better than any of the comp- competitors, which in the customer's minds are not Burger King milkshakes, but it's bananas, donuts, bagels, Snickers bars, coffee, and so on. But I hope you can see how, if you understand the job, how to improve the product becomes just obvious. That's pretty cool, right? And it's, it's a really interesting way of conceptualizing for some of um, So, um, basically this idea with jobs you don't there's like a lot of stuff out there is that you write a job story. So, you have a situation and motivation and expectation. So, as a something something, I want to something something, so I can something something. And this is like sort of the summary of what he said. So he was saying, you know, as a commuter having to work, I want to fill myself up so I can get to work and not be super hungry and, you know, have an interesting job to work. So that becomes the persona. And that's a, a different way of sort of thinking about how to do it. You know, you don't have to have the photo, you don't have to have the, the printing out thing, you've just got this one phrase essentially, and that can still help you make these design decisions. So the idea is that you're building context through this research process, which allows you to then see how the solution fits into the problem like a present piece. So in summary, because we're just running, almost running out of time, soon as the summaries of your research that you can use throughout your project. Goals and pain points are the most important parts of your presenters and those goals. Soon as help with empathy and help with storytelling. Scrappy lean presenters actually work. You don't have to go overboard for no reason at all. If you want to learn more, I'll put these slides up. There's some links to some of the things that I researched when I was looking at this. And that's it. Let me know if you have any questions. Questions? Yeah. What do they do, the zoners? The milkshakes? Well, I think, you know, whether milkshakes have a huge effect on people's lives, maybe not. Yeah. 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 So, how do you get to work with your food? And then, 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 How much do you differentiate between the persona that you've created internally with your team versus what your client thinks their demographic and audience is? Where do you sort of draw the line of they think obviously that they know their audience best, but maybe you've got a persona that they haven't yet thought of and they don't buy into what you're trying to present? I think the best way to do that is if you can, is to include your clients in some of those research interviews or put them in the show and actually like show them the point of the person's name. And that will help them to break down that bias. Because really all you want to do is make them have their own biases about what they think is going on. So if they hold them to the biases that we go on, so we do this, they'll do this. Thank you.
and the uh, topic report. Sorry,